I'm honored to be uh, joined here today uh, by a former Congressman uh, John Tierney and Mike Rogers. Um, and we're going to be talking, obviously, about uh, a number of uh, issues of, of interest uh, just to get the titles correct. Mike Rogers is a national security commentator for CNN. I know that that's important to my bosses uh, that we get that right. Uh, and a former uh, Republican congressman and uh, chairman of the uh, House uh, Select Committee on Intelligence um, from Michigan and John Tierney, a Democrat from Massachusetts. Um, with your permission, I'm just going to dive right into events uh, that are going on right now. We, uh, a few weeks ago, talked about some of the general topics, uh, trying to, hey Betsy, trying to predict uh, what might be in the news today. And uh, I, I, uh, we didn't know what the order would be, but, but uh, I think the subjects are, are, that we agreed upon two, uh, two weeks ago are still basically the same. Uh, let's start with uh, the Iran framework, if we can. Um, over the weekend, uh, President Obama um, commented on some of the criticism uh, of, the, uh, of the framework, specifically about Senator John McCain uh, referring to Secretary of State Kerry being, quote, less trustworthy than the supreme leader of Iran when it comes to uh, being the specifics uh, as outlined. Uh, there is obviously a difference uh, if you've uh, read the translated from Farsi bullet points from the Iranian government and the uh, translated from Washingtonese uh, bullet points from the White House. Um, and the president said, that's an indication of the degree to which partisanship has crossed all boundaries. That's not how we're supposed to run foreign policy. When you start getting to the point that the U.S. government and our Secretary of State are somehow spinning, that's a problem. It needs to stop. Um, Congressman Tierney, let me start with you. There are a lot of critics of this deal. Um, and uh, I think there are a lot of questions about what's in it still. Okay. Well, I think that's why it, it's inappropriate for Senator McCain to take the kind of stance that he took and start criticizing somebody saying they're spinning it. You can have your reservations about what may be in the agreement, and you can talk about uh, how you might want to make sure there are other aspects that are dealt with and things that come up. But to just start attacking Secretary of State uh, personally and indicate that he's not telling the truth or being less than open about it, I, I think just undermines the whole process of what we're trying to do with this, this government and our own country. Uh, I think he'd be much healthier if he get out there and say that you know he's hoping for a good resolution on that, but he thinks that the following issues must be dealt with. It's very uncertain what's in that agreement right now. I mean, we have an idea that is a lot more specific than we had hoped it would be, which I think gives us wiggle worm, but wiggle room coming down to the, the last three months of the negotiation. And I think that there's going to have to be some things tightened up and solidified before anybody says there's a deal. Uh, but to go out and start attacking something that isn't even a deal yet that is in progress and something that's important to our country by taking that path, I think the president was right to call him out and hopefully redirect the conversation back to what's in the agreement or what should be in the agreement and how we go forward. Yeah, I mean, obviously I'm disappointed in the framework. I think they crossed some very dangerous thresholds just in the framework. So once you've acknowledged and legitimized Iran as a nuclear state, it causes significant and real problems. And we're seeing that already. We're seeing that Saudi Arabia is interested in getting a nuclear program. Uh, they signed a deal with the South Koreans. Uh, the Jordanians signed a nuclear deal with the Russians. Uh, all of this is going to happen faster than we can put it back in the tube. That's what I worry about. So that was already in the framework. So I think people who are opposed to it, and, and we've looked at this and we looked at it when, when we served together on the Intelligence Committee, was very, very concerning about uh, any aspect of their nuclear program. So three parts of a program, the framework only deals with one, and it gave away something that I thought was really, really dangerous. That is that legitimized nuclear state. Nothing on the Iraq plutonium uh, facility other than they're going to convert to a, a powdered form, which you can reconvert, uh, but they get to keep it. Uh, so when you start looking at the elements, even of the framework, we're in a place that is really hard to walk back from. And I think that's why so many people are so critical of If of you look deal. at the comments, uh, <clears throat> Congressman Tierney, that, um, that President Obama made in the third presidential debate when he said Iran, the deal, there would, Iran would not have a nuclear program. If you look at the comments that President Obama made in 2013, a year later, when he was at the Saban Forum, um, in which he described uh, things that Iran does not need in a nuclear program. It does seem, based on the benchmarks that the president set, uh, as the Washington Post editorial board noted, this doesn't meet what President Obama said the deal would be. Well, you know, things change and the ground moves uh, as you move forward on that basis. I think you have to say compared to what? 
what are the alternatives as you move forward that were going to happen. A lot of where Iran is today got there before this president got in, uh, and it has progressed on on the, on the situation. I think you're going to find that you have to deal with the facts as they are, uh, and you have to make sure that you have an agreement that takes our national interest in mind and gets uh, us in a place that we can hopefully find that we got something that, that is in our interest. If it's not, then there won't be any deal. I mean, you have to just move in that direction, but you have to try uh, and nail down what you can because I think the alternatives uh, are hard to find. I mean, I know that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is out there railing against this thing, but what's the constructive alternative that he's proposed uh, that's realistic in any sense on that? So you, you really have to, uh, you know, the other I'll tell you is you can always go in and do a military thing, but we've played that out in committee uh, before and had the war gamings on that, and that's not a very attractive option. You want to keep that on the table if you have to, but you don't necessarily want to rush in that direction. So I think this idea of you know, taking these three months and trying to nail it down and, and get things that end up being in our national interest and solidify it to the extent that we can or where we have to go. Uh, and if it isn't, at the end, you don't sign. Uh, Senator Tom Cotton uh, was on my show a couple weeks ago, Republican from Arkansas, very critical of the steal, uh, the one who led uh, that, uh, the letter campaign. He said that he thinks airstrikes against Iranian nuclear facilities would be preferable, preferable to this deal. Do you agree with that? Well, again, it depends on what the deal is. Now, I, I don't, we don't know the details of the deal. I, the progress of the deal, I think, for those of us who've looked at this a long time, says we've got some real problems of brewing here. So I'm not sure you would start there. I mean, if you can, if we haven't gone too far away from a very aggressive sanctions regime, and th these may, may never come back. You know, the Russians, who are part of the P5 plus one, did a deal with Iran during the negotiations uh, why we're trying to get a, a nuclear deal with Iran uh, to ease their sanctions problem when it comes to export of natural gas. So they've already made it more difficult to keep, to keep pressure on them through sanctions, which worries me a lot. So I, I would not say that it's more preferable. I think that's probably not a great place to be up front. We should always keep the military option on the table. We should have never taken it off the table. We should have encouraged Israel uh, to, to uh, uh, to keep their options together on technology and other things, to keep pressure on the Iranians. I do worry the longer it goes, the, and if this deal falls apart, we were taking away all of our other good non-military options. That's what I worry about. Uh, when, when, these, when the sanctions start falling off in ways that can be meaningful, you, you won't have a whole lot left uh, if the Iranians walk away in June completely. Uh, that's what worries me. I, I, I think that's a very dangerous and a very real possibility we're going to face. I think you overstate it when you say the military option is off the table because I don't think it is, or not for Israel or not for the United States on that. But going back to Senator Cotton, you know, however much time you served and however nobly you served in the military, it doesn't make you an expert on foreign policy or on national security issues. Uh, and for him to write that letter and for the others to sign it, I thought was really atrocious on that, just not, <clears throat> not where we ought to be going with foreign policy in this country. But also, he obviously has not seen it played out as to what happens on an airstrike. It's not that simple. I mean, if you look at the air defenses that uh, Iran has, it's not Iraq and it's not a lot of other countries. It's much more sophisticated, much more capable on that. And a lot of their things are really hardened on that. So it's not going to be a walk in the park to go in and start blowing away on that. And you may not get the results that you think you're going to get. It may turn out to be a pyrrhic victory, if any victory at all. Do you think, uh, Congressman Tierney, that an Iran with nuclear weapons is an Iran that's going to use the nuclear weapons? Well, you can never tell. I, I No, I don't think right off the bat that it's going to be happening. I think there's all sorts of reasons why they wouldn't. And I think uh, that they're probably a, a, a lot more mature country than people give them credit for in, in that terms. It doesn't mean you want them to have it, uh, but it does mean that, you know, I don't think they'll be going around using it without serious deliberation and thought process going into that. Um, but. You know, that that's sort of belies the question. I mean, you don't want them to have it. If they do get it, you hope that they don't use it, and there are enough other reasons they don't. I think proliferation elsewhere, what Mike brings up, is always an issue, but I'm not sure that issue isn't going to arise whether or not this deal goes through. All those countries are already using this process as a guise to go out and explore that, saying, what if this deal doesn't come through, we're going to explore it, but they may be exploring it anyway and moving in that direction on that. So you've got a lot of balls up in the air and a lot of things to keep your eye on. I think one of the reasons I even raised the question about whether or not an, uh, 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 an Iran with nuclear weapons, not just a nuclear um, power industry, but a nuclear weapons, why, why I raised that is because on its face, I know a lot of people in the uh, foreign relations community think if you were just going to analyze Pakistan versus Iran, empirically, which one 
if you had to pick one of them to have nuclear weapons, you might go with Iran because it's at least more stable uh, than Pakistan. It doesn't have the Al Qaeda uh, facet to it. Now I know that's not a, we don't get to pick, but but uh, um, it does make me wonder if the alarmism, uh, or if there isn't or alarmism about a nuclear. Uh, yeah. Iran. Well, two consequences. One, and, and I, I disagree with you a little bit, John. I do think that the fact that the first hurdle they crossed was a legitimate Iranian nuclear program caused these governments to go out and engage in this. None of those deals were on the table even two years ago. None of them. Uh, and matter of fact, the one, two, three agreement with the UAE, I thought, was the gold standard for these agreements. So UAE has a new peaceful nuclear program, but they do no enrichment and they keep no fissile material and spent material. It all gets removed. Where do they get, where do they get the nuclear, the enriched uranium, where do they get it from? It's a combination of countries, but Russia uh, also participates in that. Uh, France also participates in that. To me, that's the gold standard of a nuclear deal in the Middle East. Um, and that was never laid on the table, never. And so right after this, the secret talks happened, and I know this because a lot of the senior leadership of those countries came to me as chairman and said, what? you've got to be kidding me. You, you give your enemy a legitimate nuclear program, and you make your friends have to get enrichment uh, and uh, export our material. What, something get, some, somebody tell me what we've done wrong by being your friend. Uh, pretty powerful argument. And so I do think that they took this, and of course the UAE now is saying, well, maybe we don't need to abide by this, maybe we should do it ourselves. So I do think that that's, that is going to spread in a, in a really negative way that we won't be able to contain candidly. There, there are a lot of uh, critics, not just from Israel, but people, leaders of Sunni Arab countries who think that President Obama and Secretary Kerry are naive when it comes to Iran and negotiated a bad deal. Yeah, well, look, they've got their own interests, too. I mean, you know, how many billions of oil come into the market if Iran and the United States uh, strike a deal and things get somewhat normalized over there? Mm -hmm. uh, so they're obviously concerned about that. They've got their regional concerns of hegemony and Iran uh, being more powerful in, in different areas on that. So they'd love to have the United States go out and carry their water. Uh, which we've been doing for a, for a long time. Really think that. that's what's chiefly motivating them? Not I think, no, not chiefly maybe, but I think it's certainly a factor. Mm -hmm. all right? They're not equipped at the moment and not willing in some senses to stand up and do what has to be done in a number of areas over there. Uh, and so that's, if the United States wants to step in and, and do it, then that's fine on that. But I think you, you look at priorities. If you're looking at Iran, obviously we don't want Iran to have a nuclear weapon program. But shouldn't we be as concerned or more concerned about the cyber the capacities that they have and the trouble that they can cause on, with that in a lot of different places around the world, and we almost seem to be not even discussing that. Yeah, that's a problem, but if I can just, just quickly on the other half of this Iran problem. The Quds Force is uh, largely beneficial from, which is a combination of, it's their CIA and special forces rolled into one group, uh, and it only answers to the Supreme Leader. It, does, it has no chain of command through either the military or the civilian government there. And so this has been very concerning because they have, you think about it, they're, they're now in Sana'a, they're in Baghdad. They're given Bahrain fits. Uh, they are uh, really pushing, I mean, they own uh, Syria for all practical purposes. They are a, a, a pretty bad influence in Lebanon. And you look at all of that trouble they've caused, and if you were that Sunni country right across the border, you're thinking, my gosh, well, you're going to make them a legitimate nuclear power, and they are going to continue to use their Quds force in a way that terrifies them. So I'm not concerned. You're I'm not, not making concerned. them a legitimate nuclear power. All right? I mean, that's not well, where Well, you legitimize going. their you ability really to have a nuclear machine. program. When you're it doesn't belie the fact that whose program. interests are most concentrated in that area, not the United States, if you want to stack them up in order of priority, where is Saudi Arabia, where is Turkey, where are these other countries, and why aren't they in there doing something more aggressive uh, about a lot of the situations that are exploding over there as opposed to us always running to the fore. I, I agree. The only difference I feel, though, is that if we don't have U.S. leadership in there in a way that separates them, you'll get uh, eternal war in that region. And one thing that we can bring, I think, is peace, right? We've had peace. Saudi Arabia has How's engaged military well. Like we did in Iraq? Well, I, I mean, we can have that conversation. <coughs> too. Great effort of bringing peace. Well, let's let, let's let's I mean, let's a, take a have that. Let's take a turn. Uh, this seems like a natural place to to turn to to ISIS, which is obviously a, a concern to the United States and every single country we've just mentioned. Um, and I should uh, also note that there will be time for Q and A. Uh, and uh, when I get the queue over there, I will open it up and uh, we'll have a microphone out there for everybody. ISIS. Over the weekend, while you were all reading Hillary Clinton's Twitter feed, um, <laughs> ISIS claimed. It controlled part of Iraq's largest oil refinery on Sunday. 
They posted images online um, that purported to show the storming of the facility. Uh, it's the ba uh, Beji oil refinery uh, 25 miles from Tikrit. Uh, they also released a video on Sunday that uh, purports to show the terrorist group destroying an ancient archaeological site uh, near Mosul, uh, the Nimrud uh, archaeological site, which the Iraq Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities um, announced uh, that they, that ISIS had previously bulldozed. So this might be um, old news, but a new video. Um, are we doing enough to stop this group? Well, I don't think the responsibility falls on us all the time. I go back to my comment earlier, you know, like why is the United States expected to be the first one in there and to go in full force on that? I think countries in that region aren't doing enough. Uh, and I Who would, specifically? Uh, Turkey, very specifically on Turkey, but Saudi Arabia has limitations, doesn't have a lot of ground troops, but it has the ability to get others to come in uh, on that basis. But you know, for the United States to say that it's gonna be our responsibility to put men and women from this country over there on the ground, uh, and expend huge you know, billions of dollars in taxpayers' money on an issue that the others aren't stepping up and taking enough responsibility on, I think is a stretch. Why aren't they? Because I know you, I'm sure you agree with the notion uh, that, that other countries with more skin in the game should be more involved, whether Jordan, UAE, Qatar, Saudi, Turkey. Why aren't they? What's the problem? Yeah, and this to me is a great study, a PhD study for someone in foreign affairs and engagement in national discrete decisions along uh, the matrix uh, to putting boots on the ground, which I don't support and I have not supported. American uh, boots. American boots on the ground. Okay. Now, special capabilities forces, I do believe, have to be a part of this and they have to be allowed to move downrange. Otherwise, we are not going to get the kind of picture on the ground that we need to be more impactful. But if you look at decisions that weren't made um, in this process, it was pretty fascinating. And, and it, I think it was, you know, there's a bit of a, an Iraq hangover for all the reasons. I think the president's policy is very different uh, than, say, mine is on engagement. But we watched as these groups got bigger and more violent, uh, these leaders from these countries came to us, including in the Congress, and knocked on our door and said, hey, there's a problem, before they were even ISIS, and said, we have this growing problem in eastern Syria. It is a real problem. And we think it's going to be destabilizing to all of our governments. We don't want the United States troops on the ground. We need some equipment. We need intelligence. We need logistics. But we need leadership. We want you sitting at the table because only one country could bring all of those different groups, could bring uh, the Qataris, the, the Saudis, the Jordanians uh, at the table, uh, the Emiratis, and have a discussion that's productive, right? Because they've got their own differences and issues that, that go, go back, and which is, I think is a very important role for the United States to play. This decision was, at that time, we're not getting involved. This is your problem. Well, that's when all the weapons started flowing in. The Qataris said, well, we'll give them to anybody that's, not, that's against Assad, which included, unfortunately, what now we know is, uh, we now know is ISIS. So this, this very, you can see this thing spiraling into the ground, and I think it was by a whole series of, of incorrect decisions. Uh, along the way. And now we've got this problem of, okay, now they're big and large and in charge, they're financing, they've got one of the best propaganda machines I have ever seen. And if you look at old, or not even old, but more recent Al-Qaeda videos, this stuff is right out of Hollywood. I mean, it is very well done, it's very sophisticated, and it is making a mark. It's recruiting people in uh, England and France and the United States and London and Aust uh, excuse me in uh, Canada and Aust uh, Australia and so now you've got this problem that we're we are still going to have to put it back together. I think this notion that we're just going to drop a few bombs at thirty thousand feet is is not going to be very. You it's had proven this, not. To you had this problem and people that should have stepped up and taken leadership didn't. Uh, and again, you know, it's like why don't the United States come over here and, and tell us what to do and how to do it and get engaged and. If you think that they were talking to you and talking to me that they weren't talking about getting the United States engaged in more than just sitting at the table and showing some leadership, I mean, they wanted United States armaments, they wanted United States troops, you know, at least the they special forces. For troops. Well, they special never forces explicitly asked for it, but they, you know, they're aware of how things creep on that basis. But they were never <coughs> willing to step up, you know, and say, this is what we'll commit in, in terms of kinetic energy and things that the ocean over there is like, come in and take care of our problem. That's not someplace we ought to be engaged. And when you look at Syria, there were multitudes of forces over there that nobody knew where they stood or who was going to take power. In fact, the information many of us were getting was that if we had tried to arm people on that or whatever, and if Assad got overthrown at that time, the likelihood was al-Nusra was going to be the one most organized and most able to take advantage of that. Uh, and that wouldn't have moved forward, you know, the ball very far from our interest on that. So it's a complex area, and trying to deal with it from afar 
when our interests aren't as heightened as the interests of the countries that are nearby and really impacted by it, I don't think it's probably the best way to go. Let them step up, and sometimes you've got to force them to do that. I really, where is Turkey in all this? All right, the, the most capable military over there, stubbornly sitting by because they don't want to encourage the Kurds on that, standing at their border, watching a you know, community get annihilated. Uh, for, I mean, that's just beyond the pale. And then to say, like, well, this is what we're going to do, and we're not going to engage. Why don't you come over uh, and start putting your you know, treasure and your people in line and, and letting them get involved on that? I don't think that the risk to the United States is that high to warrant it. Nobody likes ISIS, and certainly we want to make sure that we participate in trying to tamper that down on that. But it's going to be contained with, in Iraq by the multitude of forces that are there on that basis. Syria, nobody has the answer to right now what's going to happen in terms of that. But Iran's going to stake in the game. Saudi Arabia's going to stake in the game. Turkey's going to stake in the game. And yeah, maybe they're going to have to find a way to have a dialogue and find a way to at least cooperate in taking care of one common enemy and then getting back to having their other regional disputes as they go on. But to just keep looking at the United States and saying, look, start writing the check and start sending your people over here, I think at some point we've got to put it into that. Let me, let me throw you guys a, a curveball because I did not tell you I would ask this question. But I was wondering, get the answer first. I, 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 I was wondering this on, uh, earlier today when I was thinking about this uh, conversation. Um, well, I got one for you and I got one for you. I'll start with, uh, I'll start with uh, you, Congressman Rogers. Um, do you hear anybody of the Republican presidential candidates uh, or potential candidates who is articulating a foreign policy vision? A vision? <laughs> a, vi a vision? A, a, vi a vision? How about, or a vision, that you, a vision that you think is right for this country? Not a fair question, only in the sense that I have briefed probably about half okay. of the candidates at some point. So you're kind of conflicted so out of? I, I think I'm conflicted out okay. of answering that question. All right. Um, <clears throat> are you, are you at all concerned? Let me say this. I do believe that national security is going to be an outsized um, uh, factor in the 2016 elections. I mean, I, it won't be number one, but it'll probably be number two, and we haven't seen that in a very long time. Are you at all concerned that if the likely nominee on the other side is Hillary Clinton, that she has so much more expertise, whether or not you disagree with decisions she's made, so much more expertise, and you have so many governors running, so many people who don't who just haven't discussed foreign policy. I suspect that's why they're all taking you to lunch and, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, don't have the- uh, not buying, however, which is <laughs> very irritating. I, I can buy now, I'm not a member of and, But don't have the experience. And you have, you, there are exceptions, of course. Uh, Marco Rubio is on the Foreign Relations Committee. Um, but generally speaking, this is, a, this is a Republican crop that does not have a lot of foreign policy experience. I mean, I think that obviously when you have a former Secretary of State running, whatever, if you believe in the work she did or disagreed or agreed with it, to me, that is almost irrelevant. That comes with a lot of credibility. So she shows up, if, that, if she's their nominee, as the former Secretary of State and U.S. Senator. I think that's a lot of credibility on uh, the foreign affairs issue. So I do think that in the Republican side, they're going to have to work to counter that. They're going to either have to get their act together so that they can have a plan that people can understand that doesn't mean military adventurism in every case, right? You don't want to, the, the default position of sending in troops is always a bad idea. And we should start there and then we'll work back. But it doesn't mean do nothing either. And I think that they'll have to nuance that discussion. But I think they can hang, if you can hang on their general notion about how you can reassert American leadership in the world, how America can be reengaged in the world in a way that solves problems, not creates problems, or lets, you know, lets the house burn in some cases, like the Middle East. Okay. I'm sorry I asked you a question. Like I said, I, I didn't brief them. Ahead. We didn't discuss that at the time. The one I want to ask you, Congressman Tierney, is uh, I asked uh, Vice President Cheney once on my show if the Republican nominee were Rand Paul and the Democratic nominee were Hillary Clinton, who would you vote for? And he refused to answer the question. Mm -hmm. That reflects, I think, not only uh, conservatives on the right being uncomfortable with Rand Paul, but also, I think, a certain comfort that some conservatives have with Hillary Clinton. Does that make you uncomfortable? She is certainly uh, to the right uh, of the Democratic Party when it comes to use of force. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think the concern we have is, is she going to be too hawkish? Uh, in terms of that, trying to get over the idea that um, the misguided notion that Democrats might not be strong enough on defense or that, uh, that she might not be strong enough as a woman type of thing to try to get over that, that she goes too far in the other direction uh, is a concern on that basis. Uh, I'm always amused when people go to people like Dick Cheney and the other neocons and ask them for advice after they screwed up the country monumentally with Iraq. 
Well, well, it's an inter- it was, an interview. Say, it you know? was an interview, not advice right. seeking. But well, uh, whatever. <laughs> I'm just saying, why do we turn to them for an opinion on that? We've seen what they the vice do president. and move on from there. But at any rate, the, uh, I think it would be a concern, but I, I would wait to hear her articulate where her guys. I think the tricky area is what will you do? I think we can both agree here that we don't think sending in troops on the ground is a good notion on that, but there's a lot of room between you know, nowhere and doing that, and where would she stop, where would she go? And how would you do it? The same thing with the Republican candidates. I haven't heard any of them really articulate, except for those who signed the cotton letter that apparently think that you know bombs away is the way to go. Uh, you know that I would be very leery of that. But otherwise, I think they are going to need to have time to formulate and debate this out so we get an idea of just where they would go and where they draw the line. Former senator and governor, former Republican, former independent, now Democrat, Lincoln Chafee. Uh, that's a lot of forms. That's a lot to get on a business card, too. I just want to make sure everybody knows who we're talking about. Uh, has, is, is contemplating running. And, and one of the things he said, and I don't want to misquote him, but he said something along the lines of her vote to go to war in Iraq was essentially disqualifying for the job of president. I, I, don't quote me exactly, but it was something like that. Um, well, obviously it's not. I mean, look at all the other people that are <laughs> running and think that they're qualified but you, to but do what it. But what do you think? George Bush actually went, you know, but, and then won another term. So, but it should be. I think he said it, it should be disqualifying. I think we should be concerned about what her what her position is now going forward. Obviously, it's a concern that she voted for Iraq. I happen to have voted against it, so obviously I'm biased on that or whatever. But I think it's a concern about where is she now, uh, given where that vote. And how would she go forward on that basis as long as the other candidates as well? I mean, it's a serious issue. It's, I think the economy is going to be the first issue, but national security is going to be up there. Uh, and I'm afraid what they're going to do is it's going to get into a lot of fear mongering. Uh, and ISIS is going to be blown into a, uh, an entity much larger than it is. Uh, and things like that are going to go on, and we're going to get into a screaming match on that as opposed to having a real rational discussion on how we deal with these things with the United States national security interest in mind. I'm allowed to do one more question, and then I'm going to open it up to everybody. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm going to ask you about uh, Israel, and specifically about um, the effect of the last few months in U.S.-Israel relations uh, on the relationship and on the support the Jewish voters have, ha- uh, have had historically for the Democratic Party. There are some polls out showing uh, an erosion in support uh, of Jewish voters for both Hillary Clinton and for um, President Obama, different polls, I believe. Um, is the relationship actually damaged, or is this just uh, a lot of uh, sound and noise because Obama and Netanyahu, the respect they have for one another, knows bounds? Yeah, I don't know. I can't answer that question. I think it's going to take a lot deeper research on that. But I think you can't just speak of the Jewish community as monolithic. Uh, so I think who in the Jewish community you're talking about, uh, what's their age group, who do they affiliate themselves with, is it J Street or is it APAC? Uh, how do they look at things? And I think within those different subsets, you're going to find a lot of people much happier with the president uh, and, than not, and, and others be much uh, more unhappy with him. Uh, I obviously have real concerns about uh, the Prime Minister Netanyahu's uh, posture and what he did, and some people, John Boehner, for instance, my friend John, who invited him over, I think, right outside of protocol and in a very bad effort on that, and they've politicized this. So we really do need both parties to be supporters of Israel. Uh, and both parties to understand where it plays in the regional uh, balance over there. But to start to politicize it, I think, has been a real detriment to everybody's uh, interest on that. And it's going to take some, some effort to put it back together. And it is going to weigh in the politics. I'm sure uh, that people are going to make a rush for this. I think back since the days of Tom DeLay, when there was a large focus on going after the Jewish vote, uh, so to speak, and the Jewish money on that, and, and really started an effort on that. And, and it's had some effect. You know, this, this didn't happen just in the last few months. Um, so I, I have spent some time in Israel with their both military and civilian intent, uh, intelligence services over my time on the, on the committee and his time as chairman, as you know. And so you, I watched this up close and personal happen along the way, um, including some meetings that just absolutely took me aback to have a prime minister talk to a U.S. ambassador in a way that I have never seen until that time, and I hope, hope we, that never happens again because of something that happened. And one of the things that happened is when Israel was talking about, they were ramping up that notion that, hey, we're gonna, we're thinking about going in, taking them, taking out their facilities, if you remember this a few years ago. It was leaked to the press, and in that, in those articles, it was attributed to a senior White House official, the plans. Taking out Iran's facilities? Yes. But it was leaked how they would do it, including the relationship with the third party nation for refueling their aircraft that was as devastating a thing to do to your enemy as it is your friend. I have never seen anything like it. 
And you can imagine if you're the Prime Minister of Israel reading that in the newspaper. Um, I, well, he, and that's really started it. And then all of the other decisions combined, secret meetings. Imagine if you're the Prime Minister of Israel, an ally, reading your intelligence reports that get plopped on your desk about a secret White House meeting with Iran in Oman about a nuclear deal. After the, the, this article came out highlighting that they were uh, basically taking this opportunity to strike these targets, I mean, that is as serious and as personal as it can possibly get. Now, that didn't get a lot of press coverage, but I will tell you, I watched it de deteriorate from that, I mean, exponentially bad, right? I mean, it just fell through the floor. And so what you're seeing now in this public display is a, a whole series of events. And they were upset, of course, they came to us, and you, and which is the naive part of that was to think that you're going to go anywhere in the Middle East and not have foreign intelligence services pick up on this right. and talk to each other. And oh, by the way, tell people like me. I mean, it was the craziest thing I've ever seen. And so I don't know how the White House ever imagined that they were going to do these secret negotiations and keep them secret. What they ended up doing is offending all of their allies, scared the bejesus out of everybody in, uh, uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and again, I think then you saw this ramp up of this well, real you know, fight. That's going let's on. not forget that you know this goes on both ways and, and has a history of doing it both ways. But you know, part of what's on the line of this whole thing too is you have a credibility problem for Netanyahu now with respect to the Palestinian issue that sort of bled over into the Iran issue. You know, back when Oslo was being negotiated in '93, there was great momentum for peace. You had maybe 100,000 settlers, and they were pretty much collected together so that you could idea maybe we'll have a swap for land. But well, under Netanyahu's wash now is 300,000. Uh, they're pretty well dispersed. They're even in East Jerusalem. So where's the momentum for peace? If you are, how are you going to do that? How are you going to you know, get some of those details done? And he's done that pretty blatantly and in your face uh, against you know, the opinion of the United States and many others that you shouldn't do that. If you're really serious about two-state solution, you've got to sort of keep that in. And he took great pride in just flagrantly doing it at the worst of times. So there's fault on both sides of that thing. But it really means that right now the chances for anything happening in that area of the Palestinian question are remote at best. Yeah. Let's open it to questions. Uh, we now invite audience members to join the discussion. Please wait for the microphone. Speak directly into it. State, uh, stand. State your name. Give your affiliation. Uh, and if you could keep your questions and comments concise so as to allow as many people as possible to speak, uh, I would be uh, remiss if I didn't uh, first call on uh, my colleague, Elise Slavin, and then we'll do you right in front. Thanks, Jake, and welcome to the council. Um, I think we'll start with Congressman Rogers, but Congressman Tierney, if you want to weigh in. I was wondering if you could talk about Corker Menendez and whether you think that this is an effort to just kill the deal, because a lot of people think that's a pretext for killing the deal, and so then there is some type of military con um, confrontation. Or how does what is likely to be a veto-proof majority give Congress a real tool to help shape this deal, and is that even possible if you think, given how far the administration already is down the road with Iran? Thank you. I, I don't think its intention is to kill the deal at all. I do think it is uh, a mechanism to re-engage the other branch of government into this discussion. And I thought the president made a, just a huge tactical and strategical mistake by trying to exclude People who spend hours and hours, I can't tell you how much time we spent on these issues, people in the Senate spent on these issues to try to bring them in to the deal. I thought that was a big mistake. Because talk, nobody is opposed to talking to Iran. What people are opposed to, including me, are giving them too much. Uh, and I argued to get them to the table, they relieve sanctions just to get them to talk. I thought that was a big mistake. That told me where the negotiators were going, right? And so I think what you're seeing is a, a bipartisan group coming together saying, hey, we want the final stamp on this. You're telling us you're going to spend the next two months negotiating, a, a, putting some meat on a framework of which there is no signed deal yet. I mean, there's nothing signed, which is why you have all this disagreement in the, pub, in the in, in open uh, discussion, so that we can have that final imprimatur. And by the way, that would normally mean if that passes, and it, I argue it should pass, that they would actually have to do something very odd for the administration. They'd have to actually come up to Congress and have discussions with these people about what they're trying to do, why they're trying to do it, what they're trying to get. And I think I, they're trying to reinstate regular order on something as serious as what is, many believe, the, the largest existential threat to an ally, uh, Israel. And so 
I don't know. I, I'm, not a, I'm, I'm not a cynic about this. I really do think, and I think Bob Corker's done a really good job. It is a very hard thing for him to do, to thread that needle. I think he's done an exceptionally good job, and I think Mr. Menendez has also done a good job. I mean, he's, he's obviously he's in a tough spot for a whole host of reasons. Um, but I do think that they have walked this line very well for the right intentions. I don't believe it's, I really just don't believe that most of those members over there are thinking, well, we're just going to go for the military option up front. I don't believe it. I don't, wouldn't ascribe motives to anybody. I, don't, I don't, haven't talked to them about it, so I think it'd be out of line to do that. I think it could have the effect uh, of causing severe problems on that. And I do think there are some people that didn't want to talk to Iran. I, I do think there's a number of people that just didn't want to engage in this process at all uh, and go down that path on that. But I think that the place for, for Congress, and they have been engaged. I know there have been conversations between the White House and different um, people in Congress, and that'll continue on. But the place for Congress to weigh in is when there's a final deal and something to weigh in on. And they could, but the job of negotiating that out of doing the diplomacy uh, is with the executive branch, is with the State Department and the President on that. And I think we should think that this is a pretty good effort so far. It really puts some credibility back into the notion that not all problems can be resolved with military force, that there is the prospect uh, that with sanctions and diplomacy, <coughs> we can get to another end. It ought to give our allies confidence uh, that sometimes sanctions work, even ought to give Russia and China perhaps a little notion that sometimes when our interests align, uh, that maybe them supporting some sanctions to move things along as opposed to leaving the only option being military is not such a bad idea. Uh, so, but I, I think that that could have a problem on that, but the timing uh, of when Congress would weigh in should wait till after there's a final package for them to weigh in on and not try to interfere with the process as it goes on. The gentleman in front of Elise. Uh, thank you, Jake. Mark Jacobson from Department of the Navy. Uh, my question for both former congressmen has to do with, uh, well, we, we've all seen that, that ISIS is certainly an issue that uh, is going to divide the Congress divide uh, the parties from the administration. But what, what priority should Congress be giving some of the bigger geostrategic issues? Russia, for example. We still don't have our, our trade agreements with Europe or with Asia. Uh, we still have uh, the issue with China, but we have no law of the sea treaty, uh, not to even mention looming conflict and continued conflict in Africa as well. And I, uh, you know, my own view is that I'm a little bit worried that this discrete issue uh, as important as it is for the Gulf and for the Middle East, it's really overtaking everything else that's going on in the world. Yeah, I mean, two things though. 65% of the trade will go through the South, uh, or the, excuse me, the Red Sea. About 40% through the, the uh, uh, South the China. China Sea, thank you. Um, and so it, I argue it, uh, you, we can pretend it doesn't have an impact on us, but it has a significant impact on our economy. And right, we have a blue water Navy because we're going to protect commerce. That's the whole reason we started our Blue Water Navy. So, and I agree with you, we have some huge strategic issues that uh, some we try to deal with. The militarization of space, China's militarizing space. Russia now is getting in on that game, which means we're going to have to spend a lot more money and probably get half as much, right? This is a really dangerous, interesting time for space. It used to be uncontested for the United States until about 2007. Um, we think that if we don't I think, I should say, if we don't start pushing back on some of those issues and dealing more uh, significantly diplomatically with China, we're going to have problems. And I argue you deal with China while they're an export country, right? They become a consumer nation like the United States. You will never get them back in the can, ever, on anything. So we have to deal, we have to be tough with them today. Uh, we, they think about, I hear estimates, 20 to 50 years that they become a consumer nation. I mean, they, they can sustain themselves from what they produce and buy themselves. That doesn't happen today. Right? When that, once that switch gets flipped, I worry about how we contain uh, a country that has invested over 10 percent every single year on new technology and modernization of its military. Really concerning. The, 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 they're just now f finishing out their triad. So they have air-based nuclear missiles. They have ground-based nuclear missiles. This fall, for the first time, China will engage in strategic patrols with uh, submarines carrying nuclear weapons. And they're not pointed anywhere else. I got news for you. They're pointed at us. Right? This is a new strategic threat that we're going to have to face. And we're talking about taking our Navy down to 285. You got me on my soapbox. Actually, Since we're not. We're going to the 304. Well, it, no, that's, that, that would be great unless you get that sequestered number off there. You will be at 200 and probably 86, I guarantee you. We can debate, but actually I think that's a good point that, that doesn't, where does Congress fit in on this? The executive yeah. branch cannot make national security, security policy on its own. And right. what we see, I think, publicly, and, and I, I certainly see, is that 
we can't even get Congress to move on, mo on the most basic things. Uh, you I all have a unique vantage point now. So, so where would you go with that then? Yeah, I mean, my argument is yes, Congress is as, at, as much at fault as, this, as the administration. But when you look at the budget proposals, I did not believe last year it was in line with what the strategic threat level is. So you're right, Iran is taking up a tremendous amount of diplomatic effort. We still have a lot of work to do on China. As you, if you've seen, Russia is building up in the Arctic in a way that's really very concerning for us uh, for a whole host of natural resource reasons, we think, but it also puts them in a better position to run those bomber runs down the west coast of California, too. And so we, haven't, we really haven't dealt well with those big strategic long-term threats, both from a congressional perspective, of which I've had this argument with both my friends on the other side and my own colleagues for years, because I think we've decided we were going to get some odd peace dividend at a time when the world is getting more dangerous, not less dangerous. It made no sense. After the Soviet Union, you could see where the peace dividend made sense. It does not make sense today, uh, given the, the divergence in the matrix of the threats, the strategic threats and, uh, and other. Let's try to, let's move on if we can. Um, I'd love to do boy, girl, boy, girl, if possible. That's something that President Obama does that I think, Betsy. Mm. Hi, Betsy Fisher Martin. I'm a recovering television producer <laughs> now with uh, <laughs> American University. My question is to you, Chairman Rogers, um, speaking about the Hillary Clinton campaign now that we know she's having one. Um, how would you assess uh, her term as Secretary of State in terms of, is there an area that you think she's the most vulnerable on, and is there an area that you worked with her on that you would find admirable? Yeah, I, I thought she was one of the, the sages in the room on Afghanistan, candidly. I worked well with her on that issue. I thought she was right. She opposed the, she supported the surge, uh, opposed the uh, early drawdown, opposed the announcing of the numbers. I thought she was. Um, I thought she was right on that. Uh, I think she got uh, the, the part on Libya that was. I think is going to be a problem for them. Uh, is there were lots of discussions leading up to the Libya event about you can't just show up, do something, and leave. If you're going to do, if you're going to break something, you have to at least have some stability force. It didn't have to be us, but it had to be somebody that was missing. And when that was missing, boy, the place collapsed. I think that's a vulnerability for her. And I think the Russia issue is going to be. Uh, it's just going to be hard for her to explain uh, the, the, the notion of the reset and what did it mean and what did Putin, how did Putin take that versus what we intended. Because if you remember, all of our diplomatic effort up to that point was, how, how can they do that? Right? This is the 21st century. How can they do that? That told me somebody wasn't in the room talking that needed to be talking. They, as, as the saying goes, they may look like us, but they don't think like us. And so Putin had some very strategic goals laid up front, even during those discussions, and those never got put on the table. Keeping Georgia out of NATO, that's a win. Keeping Ukraine from uh, out of NATO and leaning west, they don't have, uh, not that they're not leaning west, but who's going to invest one dollar in business opportunity in, in Ukraine right now? It's not going to happen. That's a win. Uh, the fact that he now has uh, re-engaged opportunities uh, with Cuba on uh, uh, naval uh, uh, ports of call, that's a win. I mean, so he's looking at this so strategically different than we are. We're looking at it thinking, my God, the sanctions are killing you. What are you doing? He's not looking at it that way. He's looking at this great national figure that is, has, his scorecard looks pretty darn good to him right now. I mean, you look what he's doing in the Arctic, you look what he's doing modernizing his military, which has paid big dividends. So I think all of that is going to be really hard to explain. The thing in a presidential campaign, all the things I just talked about, most people aren't all that interested in. <laughs> so that's the, that's the, it's both a benefit and a curse. I think she'll get, gain the credibility walking in as secretary. Um, and I think Republican candidates will have a challenge of saying, well, wait a minute on, on Russia, wait a minute on fill in the blank. I feel like Congressman Tierney wants to say something. No. Are I, you good? I'm, I'm, I, it was your opinion that it was hot, so I don't, I don't have his opinion. <laughs> he he, he does, do he that. just doesn't want to share it. The, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I have an opinion. I think that you know, she's going to come out strong on that basis. There'll obviously be cases made against it, but it's going to be the same argument you'd have anyway. All right? Some people you know, really believe that everything is about you know, military force, and other people believe uh, that this diplomacy should be given a chance without giving up that final line of a military thing on that. And I think that's probably where the debate's going to come out. And I really do think there's going to be a lot of fear-mongering uh, on one side of the equation on that, that you know, the United States, anything you can put the term globalization to, apparently we have an interest in. Uh, and there's no place in the world that we shouldn't be spending U.S. money and having U.S. assets uh, you know, going on that. You read the latest uh, February 
review that was put out on that. I mean, it basically says there's every place in the world is the United States concerned. And therefore, we have to spend money and have the Navy and other troops and different things around everywhere. We have 1,100 bases by one count. I spent three years trying to get the Department of Defense to give you an idea of how many bases we had. And it turns out it depends on what you mean by bases. Uh, but I mean, you know, and it's like all, everything is that we've got to do it and we've got to have troops everywhere. There is no reason, just going back to a second to the gentleman from the Navy's question on that, this whole rebalancing issue that was supposed to happen. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of resources go from uh, you know, land forces and, and the issues in the Middle East to the Navy and to China. Uh, and you never hear a debate between the branches about how they're going to allocate resources. It's always the only autonomy we ever see is when it comes to education, uh, social programs on that, but when it comes to the military, there's no autonomy at all. It's how much more money can we throw in in addition to that, and you can never get any of the, the different forces, the Navy, the Army, the Air Force, to say, you know what, they've really got too much over here, but we could really take some of that and use it to advantage over here. I'm not uh, sure I should comment on that. You should. <laughs> I, I advise you not to. But I mean, but that's just ridiculous. You know, it's absolutely ridiculous that you never have that conversation. So when they have joint uh, forces now, it just really means like we'll leave each other alone and we'll all just try to get more. Uh, gentleman in the back has been patient. Thank you. Uh, Brett Lambert, with, now with Northrop Grumman, but previously with uh, the department, and I won't pick up for the Navy, but uh, I had the privilege and uh, actually obligation to brief you guys uh, before on matters of foreign acquisitions, CFIUS, and also cybersecurity. Uh, and as we become a more global, more commercial uh, defense uh, organization, I'm just wondering if you could comment on what you think are the issues, uh, cybersecurity in particular, but are the issues we should be thinking about uh, as, a, as a nation, but also in the, on the Hill, uh, these are big issues. They're, they're, not, uh, they're not issues that make the headlines, but they're kind of under the, under the water, if you will. I know there's a cyber bill up, and I know there's a, a lot of... Uh, <coughs> uh, organizational restructuring, but could you both comment on how you view these, these issues? Well, from my comment earlier, you can, you can probably tell that I think that cyber is not getting the attention it should get in a lot of different spheres. On that, not that we should be paranoid about it, uh, or say the world is coming to an end, but taking it with the seriousness that's required because of the havoc that can be reaped by somebody that really decides they want to use it for ill purposes on that. Uh, one of the problems I think we're going to have, and we spend a lot of time with MITRE Corporation and others, who I think Northrop was part of that group, on that, how do you get private industry uh, to take on the expense of putting in place all of the security checks that you need to have, and particularly the smaller companies? You know, we have on the one hand, we want to go to small business and we want to have smaller companies get engaged in this, but they're the ones least able financially to sort of spend the money that it needs to get the security to the level where it makes the whole system uh, be able to work. Uh, so we're still working through that problem, and folks at MITRE are, are, are trying very hard to pull people together to the table, so it's a voluntary thing, but I think you see legislation filed because it's just not happening. And if there's a chink in one place in the armor, it's going to be out there, and it can be devastating, uh, not just in the defense industry in terms of everybody getting the plans and all the intelligence on that, but uh, from all, you know, from our water supply to our electricity supply, it just goes on and on. So we've got to spend some time doing a serious effort of making sure that we have those things in place and finding a way to finance or get private industry to finance, I'm not sure you're going to be able to do that voluntarily, so that everybody along that chain has the kind of security that means that the system is impenetrable. And we, we're far from that right now and far from an answer to how we're going to do that. Uh, and Peter Singer has a, a, a book out on that. I think he did a nice job uh, with the cybersecurity issue. I don't know if you had a chance to read it or not, but he sort of lays it out and puts it in perspective, doesn't let it get out of control, but educates, I think, a lot of people who really aren't sure where it fills on that. I think two big things happened in the last two years that changed the face of cyber warfare. And I think, I disagree a little bit. I, we're in a cyber war. Most Americans just don't know it. Companies are just keeping their nose above water. It's the sheer volume of attack that's coming. So two things changed. So we knew about cyber espionage. We all knew that. We've admired the problem. We worship the problem. I, you know, now it's, it's, we, just, we've, we can't quite get to doing anything about it, but we sure talk about it a lot. In the Sony case, so yes, a nation state made the determination, and if you think about this, this should give you a bead of sweat on your forehead. This is the least capable nation state when it comes to cyber, right? About a third of their pop, uh, population has electricity 24 hours a day. They're the least capable cyber actors on the world stage. They decided that that movie, for whatever, don't even, whatever their motive was, 
They took a team outside of North Korea, because by the way, they couldn't sustain, they couldn't do it from their own country. They didn't have the capability, the infrastructure to do it. Outside, they went to a third party country, took over a hotel's servers, think of this, and then launched a very long, sophisticated attack. Here's two, two, two things that happened. One, it was not one piece of new code. They didn't have one piece of new malware that they wrote. What they did is they went out on the internet, including the black net, and went in. Black net is a place where, don't go, please don't go, uh, where you can buy just about anything you can possibly imagine. Social security numbers, dates of birth, malware, you can buy it right off the shelf. Somebody will sell it to you. Michael knows this because he hangs out there. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's a dark place. They put this together, launched a pretty successful attack, they stole stuff, we saw that, everybody went, yep, yep, stole stuff, we've seen that before. They stole the movies, that cost them intellectual property, pretty damaging economically. Then they did something different. They destroyed data. We hadn't seen that before. So they went in and wiped out people's computers. And I'm talking, you're not rebooting. That thing is a paperweight, it's gone. So think of this, this is a great American company. They had to go out, buy laptops, and try to recreate their finances. I, I was convinced that they weren't gonna make it for a while. And what now publicly we find out, we knew about this in classified channels, this is not the first time a nation state has decided to, to take a political act of destruction to try to bring economic damage to a company, the Sands Resort Casino. So the Iranians decided that they didn't like the CEO of that company talking about how dangerous it was. He gave a speech about how dangerous it would be for Iran to get a nuclear weapon. Think about this. So a nation state makes the determination with all its capability that they're gonna cause economic harm to his company. And they do it. So they got into a, uh, it's, a it's a casino and resort. They found a weakness up in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, they got onto a slot machine. Okay? Think about this. Uh, they were able to hop over to their office function. Right? So they lurked around the office for a while. Then they were able to get in over on their security side. Uh, and they were trying to get that work that back to the headquarters back in Las Vegas. It took them forever, they couldn't do it. So one person made a mistake, they showed up, they went into it for a security inspection, logged in with his password, he never changed his password, he went back. By the time he landed in Las Vegas, their system had been penetrated. It cost them about $40 million, one attack, one nation state. So I agree with you, we're not talking about this in the way we need to talk about it. Uh, you know, what we found was that, uh, you know, I thought that there would be a couple of key moments where people would go, oh my gosh, we better do something, Target. But that was between the banks and the retailers, right? So I wasn't involved. They just sent me a new credit card, wiped it clean, I got to go back to Target. Then I thought, well, you know, remember when they went into the cloud and took very intimate pictures, tend to be Hollywood people, and published them? Those were meant to be private pictures. They were, as my dad would say, naked, <laughs> right? Remember those? And we thought, well, okay, now that ought to shock, that will shock the psyche about how, how aggressive people can be to get your private information. We just, most Americans wanted to see the naked pictures of the starlets, is what we found. And now with Sony, what we found was, well, I thought, that'll do it. Now we've, we've really got an incident here where Americans can identify it with. And what we found is most Americans said, ooh, isn't cool, we can read the emails between uh, the Hollywood executives they and the more stars. More involved in the personalities. Yeah, they got more involved in their personalities and not what the event was. And I don't know what it's going to take. I worry. So it has to be prevention, because uh, the real oh, problem yeah. that Singer hits on really well is attribution is difficult. You, you, you make attribution of who did what, but it's not really that easy to get to the point where you can identify who actually did the act is a Herculean task yeah. on that. And the more sophisticated the nation state or anybody that's doing it is, the more difficult it's going to be able to track it down with some such definition that you can actually take action against it. So you know, we've really got to get up front on that. And I. I the legislation that's, that's moving along, I don't know if it's going to be adequate enough to deal with it, but it's really going to come down, I think, in the end to... If we don't get cyber involved. sharing, we're, this won't work, yeah. because 85% of the networks in America are private sector networks, and contrary to popular belief, the government isn't monitoring those networks. Right. So when they're getting attacked, the government doesn't necessarily know it. The only way they would know it is if they see it overseas first. Or if they admit it, some companies don't even admit that they've been attacked. Well, they don't, yeah, clearly. Well, look at Sony. After a while, they said, everything's fine, nothing to see here, move along, right? Almost took them off the planet, right? They, they needed to re-engage in commerce. And so this is the challenge. If we can get a cybersecurity sharing re uh, regime, and that means liability protection, I think it can work. It won't be perfect, but it'll be a good start. Is this to say North Carolina government doesn't have the answer? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I haven't been there long enough. I know the department doesn't have the answer. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's we have so time for one more question. Uh, I'd love a woman, if possible, if there are any women. I won't force it, force my strict uh, gender code on people. All right, sir. Sort of follow up on that cybersecurity issue. Uh, one thing that Congress has to do by June is to consider the extension of the Patriot Act, Section 215, and the whole question of the NSA's role and the government's role versus the tensions on privacy. Could you comment on what Congress might be doing in that area? Thank you. Why don't you start, Congressman? Well, I mean, look, I think Congress can find a solution to that pretty easily if it wants to. I mean, Jim Sensenbrenner is, you know, is out in front again you know, like on that issue, but he did have a, a lot to do with the original prospect, and he is agreeable with a lot of other people on both sides of the aisle of finding a way so that the information can be made available when it's needed, uh, but have enough due process and, and privacy rights in place to do it. It's a balance, and it's somewhat difficult, but it's not really rocket science, and it can be done. Uh, on that basis. I think that, that the Congress has the capability of doing it. I think they're moving in that direction. And if they can keep level heads at it and trying to work together to get that issue, that's one that really should have a bipartisan solution on that because the, the balance can be made. Yeah, where, where are we on the process of it? It passed the Senate. There, were, there was a NSA reform uh, along with the... Uh, I don't think they passed they anything passed on the Patriot. Yeah, no? Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, well, no. The thing that passed the Senate, I think what you're talking about was the, a, a version of the cyber sharing bill. Oh, okay. Um, this would specifically deal with the NSA's ability uh, or the FBI's ability or any intelligence agency's ability to collect. So I always, and I'm a, I'm a little bit tainted on this, but I, uh, I supported the program uh, when I was on the Intelligence Committee under George Bush. I supported the program under Barack Obama. Uh, and you know that was when it was all classified. I support the program today when it's not classified. Uh, I think it's the right thing to do. I think you can build in protections. Uh, and over time, when it was first, before I got there, when it first went in, they just went and grabbed it. Probably not the right idea. And, and by the way, they didn't record uh, your phone calls and they don't record your emails. Uh, this was the most maddening thing trying to debate this issue because it was so, we got behind the narrative and that people believed that was happening, that they were recording all this information and anytime they wanted they could go listen to Aunt May's phone call about her bunions, right? Not happening. I can't tell you how many times I've had that conversation. So I think there's a way that we can do this. I do think that they're in for a political fight on it uh, coming up and what that looks like. And my argument is, listen, it's got to be effective first. If it's not effective, let's not pat each other on the back and say that it's something that it's not. And if the political will is get rid of it and hunker down and hope for the best, uh, that's not me. I'm not there. But if that's what it is, better to do that and know than try to find something that has, it's so restrictive it can't work, it won't function. And that's the fight right now. It, it's, it's, will you know, it function? There's a number of reports done out there that I think the point of direction where there should be enough area for agreement. I you hope may so. be right, maybe I there's going to so. be a battle on it, but I mean, there's enough third party reports out there as well as, you know, probably from the White House and, and others on that. One of the reasons we are in this problem, of course, is national security structure tends to be very secretive, even to Congress. And the real problem is, you know, whatever you put in place has to have sufficient oversight from Congress, right? It has to have judicial oversight on that, has to have uh, control over who gets the records and when and what level of proof they have to get it there. But it's going to require enforcement and Congress, which has always been a tough road to hoe. Because I'll tell you, from sitting on the uh, Intelligence Committee, I swear that I thought the opinion was, how much can they not tell Congress? <laughs> you know, it was like 20 questions to get half an answer. Uh, you know, going through every single meeting on that. So there's got to be some more transparency there, and there's got to be a way for it to be set up so that Congress can actually have effective oversight for the public to get any trust at all. And once the public gets some trust, they won't be telling stories, oh, they're going after Aunt Mays, they'll listen to you. But right now, given the history of the intelligence agencies and their, their desire for secrecy, even against Congress sometimes, people are rightfully, you know, a little bit skeptical on that. And I just didn't have that same experience, I think, that you did. But lastly, the reason I think you watch the po politics on it, in November of last year, there was an amendment to require a warrant if you were going to intercept overseas if there is a slight possibility it may somebody may pick up the phone and call back into the United States. That is, this is my example, and it passed, by the way. It passed. There was five minutes of debate on it. So think about what's happening in Syria right now. If they have a terrorist identified in Syria, I, I want to know if that terrorist is calling back into the United States. You still would have to go through the warrant process once you determined it was a U.S. number. But you wouldn't be able to do that under that amendment. Uh, I am really worried that they're going to do something like that. I, ho I hope that they get to the right place, but it passed. It passed overwhelmingly. Uh, I hear what you're saying, but I mean, it, it, there's a lot more of the process to go before I it gets in. So. And there's I worry generally about that. in all of these laws and, and statutory fixes on that, there's a, a creation of an emergency aspect of it as well, so that you're not always waiting for everything to get approved if something is that immediate. 
you know, there's uh, generally a way to get it done, you know, so that the security. getting a warrant overseas. How do you how do you how do you do that? How do you present that to a federal judge, an old FBI agent? These are hard to do domestically. I don't know how you would do it based on what you don't have overseas. I'm being asked to wrap it up. That's all the time we have. Uh, I want to remind everyone, of course, that this was uh, on the record. Uh, but what a great panel we had here when Congressman Tierney and Congressman Rogers, if we could give them a, a round of applause. Thank you so much. At this point.